William, your videographer from Two Hats Publishing. Welcome to the College of Complexes being held at Barbex Restaurant at 8949 Garland Road, Dallas, Texas. Gently embracing the east side of White Rock Lake. When I entered, I was greeted like coming home to Grandma's house. Warm and friendly. When visiting the Barbex Restaurant, tell them you want your reservations for the next College of Complex class. Well, welcome to the College of Complexes. This is our 246th meeting since we started. We started in uh, February of 2009. We put a different speaker on every week, a different subject. We require a speaker to take a position on an issue or express a point of view. They have to be for or against something. We don't care what it is. We give an hour to make a presentation. If anybody, if, if uh, any speaker goes, if it goes over an hour, we cut them off. And uh, if, if uh, anybody interrupts the speaker, we remind the interrupter that we only listen to one fool at a time. That's one of our rules. And then we have questions and answers, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals. Everybody in the audience that wants to gets five minutes at the podium to respond to the speaker said for or against. And our speaker gets the last word, gets a comment, and a comment to close me. That's how it works. We, uh, we don't pay our speakers. We give them a free dinner and our compliments. That's, one of our rules also. Anyway, we have, uh, if, before I, before we introduce our speaker, though, are there any announcements? Now is the time for announcements. Anybody has any announcements? Do you have an announcement? <clears throat> Come up here and make your announcement. Yes. We want to see you. Come on up here. <laughs> Tomorrow, Sunday at 2 o'clock, Kyle Warren Park is having a humongous celebration. Uh, Southwest Airlines is celebrating the end of the Right Amendment, and there's going to be great Texas-type bands all afternoon. It should be wonderful, and it's free. Ta-da! Ta-da! Non-political. You got an announcement? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Woodall Rogers Freeway. It's that uh, two or three block long bridge over they put over the underground freeway, which turned out to be very nice, making a wonderful park out of it. So if you have a chance to go, it would be nice. We're glad you all made it out tonight. And I'll just give my little two minute uh, dissertation this evening. Um, we love being here at Barbex. It's just uh, just the right size room, and it's um, cozy. We're not sitting out in the middle of a big giant cave somewhere, and uh, so we've come to like it. People enjoy it, and have a good menu. The people here at Barbex are very kind to us. They don't charge the group a uh, meeting room charge, which is harder and harder to find in the restaurants in Dallas, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, what we do promise them we will do is we will all buy some food and feed the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, our server takes care of all of us at once and she does a magnificent job of doing that. I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> and uh, so please uh, don't be stingy on the table when you leave. And tonight, be extra kind. I understand that we are helping her celebrate her arrival on the planet. It's birthday. So, like, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Boom, boom. Okay. So, she caught it. All right. Now don't make a fool out of us. Treat her nice tonight. <laughs> Frost the cake just a little bit tonight, if you would, please. But again, we're glad you're all here. Uh, we have Jim Love tonight speaking to us, who we always enjoy. Uh, he'll always uh, 
spike our thinking and give us something good to uh, chew on and uh, ask about and talk about. So join the group and participate and have a good night tonight. Thanks. Tom, it's all yours. Any other announcements? <clears throat> Now's the time. Oh, I guess we're out of announcements. Anyway, uh, next week we we have uh, Dale Klosterman. He's sitting right there. He's our speaker. He's going to talk about will Christians be included in the New World Order? It's on your itinerary. I'm not going to read all this, but it's very good. So he'll be here next week telling us about that. So in the following week, uh, October 25th, we have uh, Susan Carpenter is going to talk about Can America. <coughs> Choking on food, excuse me. Can America withstand more so called free trade agreements? That ought to be interesting. So, we have a different speaker every week there, different subject. They have to be for or against something to care what it is. So, remember that. Anyway, our speaker tonight is Jim Love. He's going to talk about populism, the good, the bad, and ugly. He, he's, he's worked as an engineer and an educator with publications in both fields and holds a, both a BS and an MS in physics from the University of Texas. He's going to discuss how populism is back, thanks to discuss with elected leadership. He will examine the detailed causes of the popul populist uprising, including the Tea Party, and will designate between the good, the bad, and ugly. Jim will also speculate to, as to how populist anger could drive the 216, 2016 presidential elections. So without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Jim Love. Okay, thank you for coming out. I much appreciate it. Um, warm welcome. Uh, sometimes that means you make it hot for the speaker, but That's okay. That's all right. So, um, anyways, um, inspiration for this is uh, it's been short term, it's been long term. Uh, the short term has been uh, reading across various publications, the long term has been over my adult lifetime um, because things have. Um, Put a mildly disintegrated uh, over my lifetime. Anyways, uh, this talk divides into three sections. It's how we got here, and uh, once, and then we talk about um, the types of populism. That's in the end, and then in the middle, we're going to talk about um, the genesis. I mean, what it. What, it, um, what populism gave rise to. Anyways, as a rule, populist uprisings take place when the electorate is fed up with business as usual, and that's now. I mean, I, 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 I don't think anybody in this room would disagree that everybody's fed up as far as government is concerned. So we've been there a number of times in our past political history and i'll talk more on that later but to better understand where all the anger and disgust is coming from now i want to make a list of all the grievances at least these are the things that i see that have really you know fired me up and uh, bummed me out and turned a lot of us against the system all right first thing is business as usual disassembled the usa's industrial base and they rebuilt it overseas and they called it good. And it was for investors but not so much for wage earners. Thanks to the associated transfer of lots of money, lots of jobs and plenty of technology, China is now in a position to challenge us for military supremacy in the Pacific which we once thought of as an American lake, rightly or wrongly. But we financed it. So a select few could make a lot of money. And of course, the rising tide didn't float all the boats, mainly because uh, many of us didn't even have a boat, much less a yacht. 
Our southern border is far from being secured, and the volume of illegals while decreasing is far from where it should be. And we all know why that border was porous and open. It was open under both Republican and, and Democratic administrations because we liked the cheap labor. That's why it was open. Washington accomplishes little other than continuing gridlock while our infrastructure crumbles, the entitlement reform is stalled, and the tax code remains riddled with loopholes. And I'm not even halfway there yet. The Iraq War cost us two trillion and counting, more than 4,000 dead, 10 times that many in wounded, not to mention foreign collaterals. The war in Afghanistan was backburnered after 9-11 and is not yet over. Veterans of both conflicts get the runaround from the VA, and the Middle East is less stable than prior to our meddling. On the quiet, there's a strengthening Iran, and more likely, thanks to ISIS, there will be a fragmentation of Iraq. Our AAA credit rating is damaged thanks to business as usual politics, which, is all, which you can also ra uh, label as rabid partisanship, and only 10% of the House seats are competitive thanks to gerrymandering. You getting mad yet? The Supreme Court reaffirms that money is speech, even though many of our elected officials are outright bought or at least rented. The House leadership thinks that it's more important to either impeach or sue the president for alleged breaches of constitutional authority rather than do something about roads, immigration, and taxes. This, even though the president has managed to do little in large part because so many of his initiatives have been blocked. This is called firing up your base and distracting folks from having done nothing. There have been three financial bubbles three since the Carter administration, all of which popped. The bubbles burst largely because lobbyists convinced lawmakers that regulatory laws and policies were archaic and no longer needed because Wall Street now really knew what it was doing. And Vladimir Putin continues to act like a thug and the West makes empty threats while he annexes the Crimea and parts of eastern Ukraine. I believe that the threat of recession in Europe right now is now linked, or is, not, is related in the, in the markets and has been engineered by Putin in retaliation for economic sanctions. Putin can afford to dent his economy because he's a dictator, right? But our markets are not under similar control. All right. Now, that's all I could think of. You could probably think of more. But my view is, is this is a sorry record and it's something to be very much disgusted and fed up with. And it very much, to me, makes me understand okay, why populism okay, has reared its uh, not so ugly head. Now, in view of the sorry record, is it any wonder that only 7% of Americans have a great deal of confidence in Congress? 27% said they'd vote for an independent rather than a Democratic, Democrat or a Republican if given a chance. 58% now agree that the statement, quote, the economy and political systems in this country are stacked against people like me. And did you know that in 2002 that number was only 34%? So it's not really surprising that it has taken this, well, it is surprising, it has taken this long for folks to get really mad. And uh, those of you who are locals, remember the Eddie Childs bumper stickers? Remember those Eddie Childs, it says, I'm mad too, Eddie? If Eddie were around today, he'd say, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so I've given you my laundry list. These are the list of grievances and everything that's gone wrong, okay? And when I direct these criticisms, I'm not just pointing at Republicans, I'm pointing at Democrats as well. It's a sorry list of non-achievements. Now, this, in my view, has been the genesis of populism. And let's start with, after World War II, the rest of the world, of course, is caught up and the manufacturing base was rebuilt but usually with our money. In Japan and Germany, you can think of Marshall Plans or the equivalent, and with China, you can certainly think of our money. 
And as the jobs went away, and unions were powerless to do anything about it, because remember, they were emasculated, fear mounted, and so did resentment. Those are the seeds of populism. The fear was that we would never get back what used to be normal, and it was justified, at least for the middle class it was, that is to say, those who work for a living. Now there is a new normal which oversees competition and technology has ushered in, and it's not going away. The resentment came from having to accept jobs that paid a lot less than before, that's if you could find one, but it was also directed at institutions and leaders who we thought were on our side. They were not. Many elected officials were bought, I already mentioned that. Many were convinced that a rising tide would float all the boats. Many believed that unions should be emasculated and that economic justice no longer required a balancing of power. Too many also believed that light touch regulation, I'm talking about London, would guarantee unending prosperity. And then came the shock of 2008, the Great Recession, which made the investor class who had thought that the good times would never end and that they really did know what they were doing until they didn't, the investor class came to know what the middle class knew very well. They knew fear. What's going to happen to my money? And so the institutions and our leaders sprang into action, and you know the rest. There was capitalism on the way up, socialism on the way down, banks were bailed out, allowed to hide damaged balance sheets behind stress tests, while well, you and I lost our homes, lost our jobs, and in some cases lost our self-respect because we thought our inability to find a job was somehow entirely our fault. And then a bull market came roaring back out of the bottom of the recession and is yet with us, although that may be changing. Banks and markets had indeed come first. And today the banks are yet too big to fail, Dodd-Frank notwithstanding, but of all the angst there emerged a party within a party that has shaken our political foundation, and that would be the Tea Party, which is right on some things but dead wrong on many others, which I'm going to get to shortly. But make no mistake, the Tea Party is a populist movement. It's one born of anger and resentment, proudly proclaiming itself to be the sworn enemy of crony capitalism, and it is now bidding to transform the GOP, making it over into a right-wing populist party. All right, so I think, at least I hope I've made the case for how populism came about, what its roots are, and now what I want to talk about is the types of populism. And as the title suggests, there's three of them. Let's start with the ugly and work our way up. Ugly populism. Back in the 60s, radical left students were told to work within the system and forget about revolution. Some didn't, joined the Weather Underground, and even blew up buildings and college campuses, and worse. I was in Detroit, they almost burned the city down. Those radical populists were truly ugly. Today, the far right is anti-establishment too in that it refuses to accept the notion that government can be a force for good. They don't want to work within the system, they want to smash the system. Or at least throw a monkey wrench into its works. I don't think that Rand Paul, and I'm going to name names, is quite that ugly, but Ted Cruz, Sam Brownback, who's the governor of Kansas, and Jim DeMent, who is a former South Carolina senator, senator and now head of the Heritage Foundation, come pretty close. Ugly populism is now a huge wedge within the GOP too, and may yet split the party with so-called rhinos battling to take it back, and the Tea Party battling to take it over, or maybe even walk and form a third party if they lose. To show just how extreme these guys are, consider that a group of 104 elected Republican officials in Kansas recently bolted their party to endorse the Democratic challenger to Brownback, who is a sitting Republican governor. They argued that the steep income taxes, we're talking about cuts of 25%, championed by the governor, went too far and are very alarmed by damage to the public schools, damage to the state's projects, and downgrading of the state's financial rating. 
And this is just one of many wedge issues within the GOP, as there's also the import-export bank. Hanseling has quite a bit to do with that. Federal funding of roads, immigration reform, and jobs for the middle class that continue to divide the GOP. All right, now I'm going to move on to bad populism. It's like ugly populism because the belief is that the government is the problem and compromise is a dirty word. They're wrong on both counts, which is what makes them bad. Government is not always a problem and compromise is the sin qua non of politics. You do not always get your way. And the other side is not entirely wrong, that is to say the left, much less socialistic. As a matter of fact, the other side, which is the left but in the center, is not the enemy either. The other side is the stakeholder in this country, and this is what has been forgotten about on the side of the right. I'm not, and two weeks ago, I challenged um, our speaker, Ray, on this. I mean, and I insist, I insist we are not enemies and we shouldn't be enemies, but this type of thinking that says that, well, if you disagree with me, you must be an enemy, it's killing us. Moreover, what makes Tea Party, many Tea Party stalwarts, bad populist is their failure to understand the nature of politics. And this I would underline and put big stars next to it. Compromise is essential because it's preferable to paralysis or open warfare. Those are your choices. Your choices are, I mean, I know you've got your ideology. I got my ideology. I happen to be a pragmatist and I, I denounce ideologues on both sides. But still and all, at some point, no matter what your ideology is, at some point you're going to have to budge. You're going to find that your principle is not going to work in a given situation. Right? And at that point, you know, in order to get something done, you may have to trample upon your most cherished principle. Oh no, argues ideologues on the right and the left. I mean, my principles are sacred and inviolate and I'm never going to budge. And here we are. Anyways, the other side is not the enemy. Uh, as I already said, it's a stakeholder. Moreover, what makes many Tea Party stalwarts bad populists is their failure to understand nature. I already covered that. Now, this is Chuck Schumer speaking. It's the New York Democratic Senator. The way he puts it, there's one thing that separates Democrats from Republicans is that the latter has become an anti-government party while the former has not. And I would, I would, I would put it this way. I don't want to hear about, oh, the government's too big, the government's too small. There's nothing in the Constitution that says it should be a specific size. The issue is not whether it's big or small. The issue is, does it work? And, and for that, I mean, you need consent of the government. Now, if the consent of the government says we need a big government, then that's what we should have. If the consent of the government says we should have a small government, that's what we should have. But this ridiculous argument, okay, that the size matters, okay, uh, it doesn't. I mean, the issue is not the size, the issue is does it work. All right. Now, if you're wondering about the difference between the bad and the ugly, here it is. One is mindlessly anti-government, but the other at least has a rationale. There's at least a rationale. I'm prepared to admit that some Tea Party arguments for smaller government make sense. Among these are a smaller overseas footprint, because I ask the same question that a lot of people on the right say, well, when is Europe going to start attending to the problems that they have in their backyard, and why should we always be the world's cop? I mean, they can dip into their treasure, too, and they can spill their blood, too. Um, and if you uh, listen to the people on the right who talk about the welfare chiselers, in particular the people who manage to get disability pay from Social Security rather than finding a job, yeah, I'm with you. Let's throw those bums out and let's fix it. 
You know, somebody illegitimately is qualifying for a benefit because they don't want to work. They should be taken off the rolls. But I'm still waiting for a reciprocal offer from the right. What are you going to compromise on? And don't tell me that compromise is betrayal and treason, because it's not. All right, and now let's move on to good populism. Above all, it doesn't seek to smash the system, nor starve it, nor drown it in a bathtub. It wants to make the system work. It wants to solve problems. And work for whom, you may ask? We, the people. Not the lobbyists, not the special interests, not we the ideologues. Hence the cry to take it back is voiced by all sides at all times, such as these. And these times, of course, are times of maximum disgust, as I pointed out with the uh, statistics that I listed at the very bit. Uh, very. Here's a hopeful sign. Business interests are now calling for things like continuation of the Export-Import Bank, tax reform, immigration reform, and rebuilding of the infrastructure. I would even agree with uh, the business interests on Wall Street, on the right, who say we do need a lower corporate tax rate in order to be competitive overseas because you got this huge inversion debate that's ongoing right now. And there's a certain truth to that, is that they ain't gonna liberate that money and bring it back, okay? If they're gonna be taxed at rates that are uh, disadvantageous as compared to the rest of the world. However, there's an important caveat to that. Let's reform the tax code, let's lower your rates, but then whatever the rate is, that's what you're gonna pay. I don't wanna hear about any loopholes. Anyways, one hopeful sign is that business interests are becoming disenchanted with the hardline ideology on the right. And for some strange reason, they don't think that suing or impeaching the president is going to do much for their bottom line. <laughs> All right, so what I've done so far is I, I think I've laid out the grievances, the things that have led to this mass uh, disgust. Um, and now it's manifesting itself as populism and we got all these various brands of populism and what I've tried to do is I've tried to separate them and to distinguish good pop populism from bad populism. So now let me sum it all up. In summary, we can say that populist anger is more than understandable. Given the incompetence and corruption of our leadership taken together with either apathy or misplaced trust on the part of the electorate, how could it be otherwise? I mean, you'd have to be brain dead not to be sick and tired and furious, okay, at the situation that uh, not just our leadership, but we ourselves have put ourselves in. And this is over my adult lifetime. And now that we've been had, it's a shame on them notion that is resonant across the land. And by God, so the outrage vow, we will make sure it's not gonna become a shame on us history. And that's why the populist parties are on the rise. So know this, both major parties are very aware of this anger and each wants to use it. The Tea Party is seeking to take over the GOP drive the rhinos out, and thus far they have certainly gained a lot of ground. The Democrats, on their part, seek to be good populists by emphasizing how the middle class has been screwed and how government will play a lead role in righting that wrong. And you will hear this again and again and again from Obama and his uh, surrogates, okay, about what we're going to do for the middle class and you know the wage disparities, the wealth disparities, et cetera, et cetera. You've heard all that, you know all about that. So far, so good, but there are as always devils in the details. Within the GOP, there's the Tea Party versus establishment and the winners yet to be determined. Either way, there's gonna be a fallout. If the establishment wins, the Tea Party may even yet form a third party or at least sit out the next election, bad. No more, no more Republican presidents for the foreseeable future. And should the Tea Party win, many business interests could go over to the Democrats with the same out, outcome for the GOP 
as when Goldwater ran in 63, a smashing defeat, kissed the presidency goodbye. Too many constituencies, not just business, think women, blacks, and Hispanics too, will vote against the wild-eyed crazies on the right. But the Democrats are not going to have smooth sailing either. Should Hillary win the nomination, especially if a Tea Party populist is running against her, she will have a hard time selling herself as the people's choice. At $150,000 per speech, she will be painted by the opposition as Wall Street's darling, with not much separating her from Mitt Romney when it comes to wealth putting out of touch with a common man. Hillary has many things, but she, within the last 30 years, has certainly never been dead broke. What's more, she has a dynastic name that populists, in general, do not like. So, let's fantasize and imagine what might happen in 2016. And this is pure speculation. I mean, uh, you'll need that and a dollar to get you a cup of coffee. Let's say the Tea Party wins control of the GOP and Rand Paul is its nominee for president. This is just speculation. What's more, polling and focus groups show that populist anger trumps everything as the economy is no longer as sick as it once was. Let's say Hillary stumbles in the primaries, challenged by Elizabeth Warren, who arrives at the Democratic Convention with an impressive string of wins and controls an even more impressive number of delegates. After many ballots, she is awarded the nomination because A, she is a true populist, and B, she'll get the women's vote anyways. Improbable? Yes. Likely? No. But stranger things have happened in American politics. Richard Nixon was a national joke after having lost the California's governor race in the early 60s, but populist anger in the Deep South think the Civil Rights Act and George Wallace, okay, and a badly split Democratic Party because of Vietnam and the disastrous Chicago Convention made him the president. How improbable was that? Reagan was dismissed as a has-been actor and supported Nixon all through Watergate. Very popular president. For that matter, how improbable were Obama's chances back in 2007? He made it in large part because of the Iraq war disaster and the onset of the Great Recession. America overcame its prejudices and anti-intellectualism, and America is anti-intellectual, electing a geeky president because we figured that we needed someone really smart at the helm to fix things, and you know the rest. Anyways, my closing sentence for all this is stay tuned and fasten your seat belts because populism is back. Democratic Party is going to work on behalf of the middle class in the coming election. I don't think they're. I don't think they will. They haven't been. They're not addressing any of the real issues that are the root causes. Well, it, it's a mixed bag. Uh, uh, there's I'm absolutely sure that they're going to use that as an issue to get themselves reelected, and that you and I, I'm sure we could agree on that. But whether or not they will truly work to do the things that I think should be done to undo all the damage, I think it's very much of a very much of a mixed bag. Again, it has to do with all the money that's in politics and who's bought whom. Uh, uh, you know, the answer is is uh, guys like uh, Bernie Sanders who are who who have less PAC money behind them you know, probably can afford, okay, to be more populist in their outlook, okay? Um, Hillary can't. I mean, that, that's, that's a, a, it, it's a downer, I know, but <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. 
Jim, I lived in Chicago when Detroit was burning in the 60s. I lived in Chicago when Detroit was burning in the 60s. I don't think it was the weathermen. Was, is that what you were saying? Or was it Martin Luther King and the riots? That well, Detroit to burn. Boy, yeah, you're really trying to get me in trouble here. Well, you, you <laughs> said it was the weathermen. No, 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 no. I, no uh, so well, I mean, there was there were all sorts of uh, diverse elements, okay, revolutionaries, okay, yes. who felt like the system had to be overthrown, right? And I can tell you, uh, there were many people at the time. I wasn't one of them, but there were many people at the time who thought that the revolu revolution was at hand. They absolutely. And what had they this, absolutely and nothing to do with Martin Luther King's assassination when Detroit burned. I, you know, I was well, yeah, there. Yeah, it, 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 it did, it did, right. uh, uh, but, well, here's, here's the deal. Martin Luther King comes along and he preaches uh, nonviolence, right? But then here come the Panthers and, here, Panthers, and here comes Malcolm X, right? And so now there's this split, okay, within, uh, within the black movement. Okay, and there was a sizable element of them, who, whether you want to call them revolutionaries or not, they were armed. Okay, and they were they were they were out to kill. And they thought the revolution was at hand, right? And they thought uh, some, not all, but some, but they thought that uh, uh, the, the the pathway to a new and improved society was a race war. Well, I don't agree with you, but that's your. Well, I, no, no, I'm, I, I'm not. I'm not saying. That I agree with them, but I'm saying that this was the thinking in many quarters. Yeah, John. Yeah, I have several questions. One, um, would, do, you, do you agree that the populist movement seems to be a, an, an appeal to base emotions? Well, let, let me answer that. It depends on who you're talking to. If you watch the uh, investment programs like CNBC, like I do religiously every day, populism is a dirty word. Okay, it, 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 it represents um, uh, the great unwashed uprising, okay, who, who all they're interested in doing is being takers at somebody else's expense and redistributing the wealth, okay. I, do, I certainly don't mean that, I mean, uh, but it, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, what it means to me is that occasionally from time to time in the history of this country, um, People have become fed up with business as usual, and they put together populist party. Like fighting Bob LaFollette out of Wisconsin, okay, who, by the way, was a Republican. I mean, uh, and a progressive, and even Teddy Roosevelt, you could argue, was on the populist progressive side. They, they, these look to me to be like good populists. They could see the abuses of power and wealth, okay, and uh, and let's be honest about it. I mean. Um, uh, people should not sh shrink at using the word redistribution. They should not shrink at using the word re redistribution because what happens when too much wealth gets concentrated in too few hands, what happens is they buy influence and they buy politicians and they buy laws and they corrupt the system. And the way you curb that, okay, is by taxing the hell out of them. And that's called redistribution. But what you do with the money is equally of important. You take that money away and then you reinvest it in things like education and roads. And you don't apologize for redistribution and you don't apologize for progressive taxes because it's required. It's absolutely necessary, you know, if you, so, you, so you could come even close to having a, a, a non-corrupt society. Yeah. Go ahead. Second question. Yeah. Um, do you do you would you agree that a a progressive party, not not a populist party, but a progressive party that had concrete plans, um, is is required? Oh, absolutely. I've been arguing. Uh, uh, well, I, I I mentioned DeRay uh, last time around, but I'll, it's worth repeating again. This idea that there's been a socialist creeping socialist takeover is ridiculous on its face. The right wing has been winning for decades. Winning. 
big time, okay? And uh, a confession on my part. My, my deepest disappointment with Obama is that he didn't see himself, okay, as, as the guy who's responsible for reviving the New Deal, okay, and rolling back all of the gains that these people have made. And if you say, well, what are these gains? The banks are entirely unregulated, and there's been three bubbles. They've done as they damn well please, and they've been bailed out every time by the taxpayers. That should, it makes me mad. Third question. Yeah. Do you, do, do you think that Americans will, will ever see themselves other than the sons of exceptionalism? Well, it, it depends. We're fond of seeing ourselves as being virtuous and, and, and of course, Europeans, you, you excluded, of course, as being, uh, absolutely, you know, corrupt. Corrupt, you know, but uh, you know, I have news for the American people. I mean, we're just as we're just as corrupt, you know, and we're not exceptional in the respect that we're immune from corruption. I mean, anybody who's been paying attention for the last 20, 30 years, you know, if you can't see or smell the corruption, I mean, I mean, where have you been? What have you been doing? So we're not exceptional, okay, in that respect. The country is exceptional in the respect that we're founded upon uh, an idea. And according to Lincoln, we're the last great hope for the world, you know. Uh, and my faith in that statement, okay, is challenged every day because the idea is, is that we're capable of self-governance. Now, what tests my belief on a daily basis of our ability to govern ourselves is if you tune in to the hard left-wing stations, you're listening to propaganda, and these people are busy, busy telling people what to think. If you tune in to the right-wing stations like Fox, and both sides are telling patent lies. Lies, you know? And, uh, and it does raise, at least in my feeble mind, are we really capable of self-government? I don't think that even the founders intended under our Constitution that everybody would have a say. Women certainly didn't. Slaves certainly didn't. And it was only men of means who had property who were judged to be worthy, okay, of the vote, okay, were going to be allowed, okay, to have a say in what went down. So, Susie. Oh, you're next. Yes, I have well, a couple of questions now. Uh, Can you, hear you? you were talking about redistribution uh, from the top down. Um, I, I personally don't see it that way. I see it as redistribution from the bottom up. I mean, the Walmart children didn't get rich by paying standard wages they got rich paying the very least that they could and taking advantage of tax loopholes and so forth and so on and we see that with every single corporation that makes the most money are taking money from the poor and giving it to themselves that's the question was Exactly. What? How are you defining redistribution? And my answer is, it's wrong. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. The wrong, I'm saying the, the real redistribution is the opposite of that. What's your question? I just asked. All right, but let me respond to that a little bit. The point about redistribution is, is not to redistribute for the sake of redistribution, to punish the wealthy for having done well. That is not the point. It's never been the point. I'm a capitalist, 
Okay, and I believe in my heart of hearts that the, the, the best economic system for making money is capitalism. And the reason it, 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 you think of it as an engine and you can think of, of human nature, in particular greed, as the fuel. I mean, that, that, that's the way it works, okay? But here, here's the problem. It's not so much the redistribution as what you do with the redistribution. And, and here's what my main concern is. If you're going to tax folks to prevent them from corrupting the political system so they can become even wealthy, I mean, you still need to do something with that money. In my view, of what you need to do with the money is you need to invest it in training and education, okay, for uh, those who are worthy of it, right? Those who are poor, who want to become members of the middle class, or those who want to strengthen their position in the middle class. Now, there is no reason in the Constitution I can find for doing this, but there's a sound, practical, common sense reason for doing it. Presently, I don't think anybody in this room will disagree that people have lost faith in this system. Anybody disagree with that? lost faith in the system. Now, if you want people to have faith in the system, what you have to do, okay, is you have to make good, okay, on a promise that if you work hard and play by the rules, okay, you will, if not prosper, okay, at least you have a chance to move up, get ahead, and prosper. And to the extent that that can happen, and to the extent that people believe in it, okay, then we got something good going. To the extent that it's not happening, and people say, well, the hell with them, that's their problem, okay, I got mine, okay, we all have a problem. So, I do not base my call for redistribution uh, on a basis of uh, punishing the rich. I do it on a basis of let's use the money to create a society that's worth living in for everybody. Susie. How long have you been a college professor? So, oh, I taught maybe 10 years. But it was math, it wasn't this. Okay, so over the, over the 10 years that you taught, one of the things, that, the reason I ask this question is, one of the things you mentioned is we have to be able to think critically, right? To, and, and raise children to think critically as opposed to teaching to the test, which, you know, there's so much backlash against now, where people think that they have to have the right answer and they're willing to cheat to get that answer or, you know, have their study buddy help them fill it in. So I guess my question for you is, how do we nurture that critical thinking skill in young people, and even in older people who kind of get stuck in their ways, who have stopped analyzing, you know, thinking that because maybe there was one thing that the government did to them or did to a group of people in New York City, then therefore the whole government is corrupt, you know, taking this extreme stance, which I think is where your talk is going. How do we nurture critical thinking in people not to criticize, but to differentiate between, you know, just because there's one thing that happened doesn't mean that the entire system should be drowned in a bathtub or whatever. Well, I think what your question goes to is, uh, to what extent uh, can we govern ourselves, which requires an informed electorate that can think for themselves. I mean, that's where, that's where, your, question, uh, where, where your question goes to. Uh, and that is what causes me from day to day to have my doubts. I mean, I, to be, to, to be, uh, well, let me finish. Uh, to be very honest about it, um, I think we need to uh, make every effort, um, every effort to um, raise the consciousness, I guess is the psychobabble term, you know, but. Um, and, and to teach people, you know, how to think, but, but at the same time, I mean, uh, I taught uh, physics, for example, and the one thing that became very clear to me is that some people have it and some people don't. So that issue is going to have to be dealt with 
as well. I mean, if we are going to have uh, consent of the governed, um, you know, you ask yourself, I mean, how can it be that Fox, for example, is so successful with the most watched station, okay, on TV? And the answer is because many people are incapable of, of, of comparing fact A with fact B and saying, well, these cannot be reconciled and they just believe what they hear. Now, I'm, I'm sorry to down people and to say, well, maybe uh, a certain category, a certain percentage of people are going to be incapable of being educated up enough so that they can make a functional democracy work. But that may be the case. And that is what gives me pause from day to day. I mean, uh, there's plenty of people out there who are more than happy to tell you what to think. Hello. Hank. Can, can you repeat your speech? I got here late. <laughs> no, but I'll give you a copy. I'll, I'll, even, okay. I'll, I'll autograph it. How's that? <laughs> I did catch one thing. You said uh, this country is completely right wing. Uh, no, no, I didn't say that. How, uh, how'd you say it? You said something like that. The right wing has been winning. And they've been winning since uh, the time easily of, um, no, before that, uh, uh, Truman. It began with, uh, they, they overrode Truman's veto of the Taft-Hartley Act. That was number one. That was the first thing that happened, okay? Um, they completely deregulated the banks. There have been three bubbles, right? Usury used to be at 8%. And all sorts of states have changed their laws, okay, at the request of lobbyists, okay, so that now credit card companies love to charge you 20 and 25%. Okay. So is Bill Clinton a uh, right wing? To some extent, yeah. I mean, tri what, that's triangulation, my, my friend. I mean, uh, uh, NAFTA is, is uh, a part of the reason that you, you see so many uh, 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 people coming across the border is that many Mexican peasants couldn't compete anymore with agribusiness thanks to NAFTA because they could, uh, they could offer the same product for less. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. Huh? Huh? Do you think, well, let me give you two examples before I ask this question. It's a fact that if you took all the household wealth and divided it by 316 million people, it would equal 213,000 each or you took the total household income and divided by 316 million people, 43,000 each. Don't you think it'd be a good idea for progressives to use those kind of facts when they're making their pitches? And they're not. Well, the answer to that question is it worked for Huey Long. But the problem is, is that the United States is not Louisiana in 1935. <laughs> so you'd have to be careful uh, with that. Again, I want to come back to this idea of, of, of redistribution. It's not for the purpose of punishing the rich. It's for the purpose, okay, of, uh, uh, of A, preventing them from corrupting the political system any more than they already have. That's number one. And number two, you take the money that you get and what do you use it for? You use it to put programs in effect to keep people believing in the country. Education, training, okay? I mean, you want to have people running around saying that I believe, okay, that this country believes in me and I'm going to be loyal to it and I'm not going to try to... Uh, uh, burn the city to the ground like they tried to like they tried to in Detroit where I lived and um, uh, and they don't want to overthrow the government because they think and have reason to believe that the government is on their side at best at best these days people believe that the government is indifferent and many people believe that the government is actively working against them how can you believe that the government is on your side 
Well, we entirely dismantled the industrial base and rebuilt it in China, okay? And then we're going to have uh, maybe a Pacific War with the Chinese, and then guess whose children will be asked to fight in that war, okay, against an enemy that was made strong, okay, while a few people became rich when they rebuilt this industrial base and re-exported products to the United States because they could sell them here cheaper. Now, I could be completely cockeyed in my assessment of the situation. If I am, please tell me, because I would really like to be wrong. This is one thing I would like to be wrong about, but I don't think I am. Uh, Jim, why don't you tell the people who passed NAFTA and the World Trade Organization while you're up there? And a minute glass steagle bottle, for that matter. Well, glass steagle served us well from the time of, of Roosevelt. There were no bubbles because they separated the finance, finance banks from the mundane, you know, give a guy a mortgage type, type banks, okay? But uh, as soon as they, uh, and I remember that when they deregulated the SNLs, everybody in this room who's been in Dallas for a long period of time can remember the I-20 corridor and all these buildings that were built and all the paper flipping that went on, okay? And uh, it was, uh, the, the name of the game was you get uh, an appraiser, an appraisal higher than the one that preceded it and sell the paper to somebody else and he'll get an appraisal higher than before and he'll sell the paper to somebody else. and. Everybody except the last person stuck holding the paper is going to be happy and everybody else is going to make a lot of money. Now, you, you know, I, I name names and I, I, I go to both sides. I can name Democrats, I can name Republicans. In this case, I'm going to name a, uh, name a Republican, right? Not many people know the name Neil Bush. Anybody know the name Neil Bush in this room? Neil Bush. Silverado. Remember, remember Silverado? Neil Bush is forever banned, okay? from having any transaction relationship with any savings and loan in Colorado, okay, because of multiple ethics violations for which he made a ton of money. You know, believe me, you, you, can go, you can go look on the internet. Now, he was not charged, okay, with breaking any laws because he was nicely lawyered up. But Jim, but Jim, it was Bill Clinton that passed NAFTA, the WTO, to well, Minnie glass steagle Well, as I say, I mean... I think he's the greatest thing since... Well, as I say, I do not immunize re Democrats from criticism. They're corruptible, too. It depends on which one you're talking about. Hi, Jim. Um, Robert Skidelsky, who is a biographer of Keynes, book I recommend, has said that the Western world will not wake up and the population change and understand that unless there's another two huge financial crashes. What do you think? Well, I hope not, but... Um As you've mentioned before, I mean, the, the amount of time that people hold stock or institutions, generally speaking, is a matter of seconds on the New York Stock Exchange. And, and certainly that wasn't the intent of the stock exchange. The stock and bonds were supposed to represent value in companies that were supposedly promoting growth. Now, I've been uh, studying and wading through Piketty's ponderous tome that, that yeah, and I, I can only... I have to do it in the morning, otherwise I go unconscious, I, you know, and I, I read like two or three pages. But one thing that is worth noting in connection with what you raised here, um, your lifetime when you came over here as an expat uh, and when I graduated from college is singular. It's singular because it's one of the rare times in the last three years of recorded financial history when growth exceeded the return on investment. This is his big fundamental premise in his book, okay, is that um, um, the rich get richer and everybody else gets screwed because of the fact that um, 
typically speaking, the return on, on investments is like 5%, but growth historically has been about one-tenth or two-tenths of 1% a year. And his prediction is, is that we're returning to this low growth mode. And that so what we got used to, you and I as young men, as normal, was highly abnormal. It was highly singular. It's only happened, one, and, and it only happens in the wake of huge disasters like World War II, World War I, when huge dents, okay, are made, okay, in uh, wealth, investment wealth. But again, this, this is another thing that gives me, I mean, I keep calling, I keep calling for a, uh, a representative functioning democracy and consent to the government. And then there's another voice inside my head that says, but is it possible? And then I keep saying, well, we need to get back to normal, right? Which is what I got used to when there was plenty of jobs and lots of money to be made, okay? Even if you're a non-degree. But I'm thinking 60s, 70s, and maybe even into the 80s, right? But what if that was abnormal? And getting back to, and, and maybe what I'm saying to myself is, I would like to get back to abnormal. <laughs> right. And if you want to know um, more about, about my abnormalities, just talk to Mary, she's right over there. <laughs> yeah, she'll let you know. Jim, Jim, over here, over here. Yeah. Uh, you know, outside of the uh, balance of trade, did, did you say that, uh, that we had much of a hand in China's emergence as such a uh, world power? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they make tons of money with which they're building a navy, they're building an air force, they're building an army, and they're stealing as much technology as they can. They've transferred as much technology as they possibly can, okay? And we jump-started them. There's no question about that. We absolutely did jump. It's as if we had a Marshall Plan designed to make China into our Pacific rival. Susie. Um, this question follows up on Dale's question. Um, you mentioned that we, like the United States government, dismantled the manufacturing and industrial and shipped it to China. Um, could you clarify that? Because it's my understanding that corporations did that well, yeah. rather than the government itself. Well, I mean, was it the permissiveness? Well, how, here, how do you qualify that? Here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You're, you're a corporate head. You're a CEO, right? Now, you're saying to yourself, if we don't do it, our competition will. Because you could get uh, labor um, at like 50 cents an hour there versus $10 an hour here because of union. And even the shipping costs weren't enough, okay, to, to, to dent that, right? And as long as you could sell it back into the market, there was enough purchasing power. I mean, this is something that uh, they had to do, right? Now, that being the case, uh, and there, there was no power that could intervene that prevent them from doing it. I mean, the idea that unions, okay, are all powerful and, they, and, and that they uh, determine anything is a joke. If unions were all that powerful, not a single job ever would have been shipped overseas. They would have taken care of their own, but they had no power to prevent that. Um, they did for third, until the third seven. As much as they could, as much as they, as much as they could. But, but here's my point. Companies will tell you that, oh yes, we have all sorts of stakeholders in mind, and we're not only thinking of the stockholders, and we're not only thinking of uh, my bonus, and we're not only thinking of the stock price, okay, but we're also thinking, okay, of the health and well-being of, um, of, the, um, of the country. You know, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that because there's inversion going on and they, they, they headquarter themselves, okay, where it's, they, they make the most uh, money that they uh, uh, that they possibly can, and as far as um, 
worrying about stakeholders who happen to be citizens. It doesn't happen. I mean, they're worried about the bonuses, they're worried about the stock price, and that's about it. Now, um, we have tried, uh, Putin, who I don't admire, I've called him a thug, but I mean, Putin, uh, here's how they do it, and I don't recommend it, but I mean, just to, just to, to sharpen the difference, uh, Putin tells um, the oil companies, we're talking about Gazprom, you will compete as a capitalist worldwide. We're a capitalist nation, right? In that respect, and you're going to sell in the open market, and uh, uh, but at the same time, you will think of yourself as a national champion, which means that uh, uh, consideration will be given to what does this do to Mother Russia as, what is it, as well as, as what does it do to your bottom line and to stockholders around the world. So they have these dual considerations. And not incidentally, last but by no means least, 51% of all stock is owned by, by the Russian government. Now I'm not advocating that, I'm not recommending that. I think it's a bad idea. But I think it's important to keep in mind that there are degrees, there are degrees, okay, of how you address yourself to who owes who what. Now, with respect to the United States, we've gone way too far, okay, in accommodating ourselves to uh, uh, letting the market decide everything. And the market does a wonderful job as far as uh, pricing is concerned, but the main problem with capitalism is this. It has to be saved from itself periodically because it goes off the rails. I mean, that's, there's, there's, no, there's no question about that. And capitalism is wonderful at making money, but there is no formula within capitalism, okay, that everyone can agree on that tells how you should allocate the profits. How much do investors get? How much do workers get? There is no such thing. Now, this is where redistribution comes in. The mechanism by which money is redistributed is always political. Hence, the minimum wage laws. Hence, recognition of unions. Hence, the NLRB. Now, pure capitalists don't like that because they think the market should decide everything. I don't. And the reason I think the market should not decide everything is when they do, um, not only does capitalism collapse, but the country collapses because nobody believes in it anymore and nobody believes in it anymore. They won't fight for it, which is exactly what happened to the Roman Empire. Exactly what happened. So, here we are. Jim. Yes, sir. I'm over here. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. It's very good. Uh, given the fact that history shows that our founding fathers were brilliant, and they gave a system to the world that brought a people that were pretty much in disarray with a lot of diverse interests into the most powerful nation on earth and the most prosperous nation on earth for a period of time, what is the primary responsibility of the United States government and what is the primary responsibility of its people? Well, the primary responsibility of the government is, of course, to keep us safe. You know, all Republicans and Democrats uh, will agree on that. National security is certainly the, certainly the number one thing. Now, how you do that, if you're talking about enemies from without, enemies from within, whether you're talking about economic security, it gets complicated. In, in a big fat hurry. Um, as far as the uh, as far as the founding fathers and the Constitution is concerned, um, I'm not a strict constructionist, and I'm not a originalist. As far as human rights are concerned, I, I certainly believe with the idea 
that uh, rights are God-given uh, and no government can confer them or take them away. I mean, on that, I'm inflexible and I agree with the Founding Fathers. But the Constitution, unfortunately, was written in a period uh, remote from ours and the Founding Fathers couldn't envision everything you had to deal with. And I know the Second Amendment, what its concern was, was that being able to raise a militia, okay, and keep and bear arms, okay, so that you could put up a fight in case, um, say, a militia from a neighboring state or a foreign country came. But I mean, these days, um, I find it hard to believe that the Founding Fathers wanted to preserve an absolute right to have guns so that people could shoot up kindergartens and kill dozens of kids. So the view, my view is this, is that the Constitution is a living document and it cost, constantly has to be reinterpreted to meet the needs, okay, of, um, of promoting the general welfare. That's in the Constitution. That's what the government should be doing, is promoting the general welfare. And I would go so far as to say to, Mr. S to Justice Scalia, if you have to misinterpret the Constitution to promote the general welfare, just go ahead and do it. Don't you think I should issue them KKK suits <laughs> Well, I mean, Question, uh, what effect do you think that money uh, relating to elections has to do with the corruption and the imbalance of our country? Everything. <laughs> Just, in a word, everything. You know, it's not one man, one vote, it's one dollar, one vote. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, population uh, ratio to delegates that the Founding Fathers created in the Constitution? I know it was smaller, but uh, it's, it's grown larger, but I, I don't know what it was then. It was smaller, I, I do know that. Uh, well, it stopped uh, being in existence completely in 1925 to 1929. <laughs> so what we have today, instead of what they had suggested is one to 200,000 in the 1925 era to one to over 900,000 people today. What effect do you think that has with the money in politics and the corruption and the middle class not being represented in the government? Well, uh, I don't think the numbers uh of, of people matter so much as the amount of money matters. I mean, the way it works, at least on, in, on the right, is um, if you get control of the legislature, you can redraw the districts and gerrymander and have a safe district, right? And once you do that... Only if it's regulated by the federal government, because it, gerrymandering is a partisan issue. No, that's a state's right issue. The federal government stays out of it. You win control of the state house. No, I'm saying we need to have it oh, yeah, uh, yeah. be a federal, federally yeah. regulated because the local people could not be trusted to do that correctly. Well, it's the other way around. Partisan. Yeah. It's the other way around. What's happened is that um, enough money comes in to, um, to get a, as in Texas, to get a completely red, that is to say, right-wing um, house in Senate. Then you redraw the district, and if it stands up in court, the state if it stands up in court, yeah, but what's, what's as I mentioned earlier, like 90% of the districts are now safe. So and that's another respect, that's another issue that the right has won on. At the local level, under states' rights, they've gone in and they've gerrymandered districts and they can say what they want and they can do what they want. 
because they know that they're safe. Well, it does need to change, but of course the problem is how do you do that? It's not so easy. Yeah, John. Yeah, two questions, you. Do you do you um, do you think the American public believe that they currently have a capitalist system, or that they've ever had a capitalist system? Well, I, I'm going to answer, uh, answer it by not answering it, then I'll answer it. Uh, but I don't think they believe we have a democratic system. You know, I mean, a small d. You know, it doesn't certainly represent uh, 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 their interests. But as far as a capitalist uh, system is concerned, yeah, I think they believe that we have a capitalist system because when it comes to the bottom line and making money, uh, that's going to be the top priority and concern. Uh, hence, the jobs going to China. You know, but that's odd when it's patently obvious that this country has self-sabotaged itself under this system, under this capitalist system. So, how can how can you believe you have a capitalist system which which is self-sabotaged the, the entire country? Well, I, well, I guess you'd have to define what you mean by a capitalist system. If if you mean a system that you make investments and you have growth and you uh, employ people, uh, no, we don't. But if you have a system where people are free to speculate, okay, and move money around, okay, in that respect, it is a capitalist system, but I would argue that it's, it's a perversion of what it should be. Well, yes, you can't, I mean, a, a speculative system is not a capitalist system because if you, if you ever read um, Adam Smith, I mean, that's entirely, you know, a, Contrary to what he, yeah. what he said a couple of system was. <laughs> yeah. And, and just parenthetically, I mean, all this um, quantitative easing that the Federal Reserve has been pumping out, the large part of it went to, into total speculation. It was nothing to do with a proper capitalist system. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, that's why the, the, the stock market, you know, goes through all these gyrations. If they even catch a whiff, okay, of them either cutting off the bond buying, which they are going to do, or raising the rates, okay, yeah, raising the rate. I mean, the, the thinking is there goes the spread. So, so basically speaking, would you agree that the average American doesn't understand what a capitalist system is? They don't understand the way the system as presently constituted works. I would agree with that. Some of us are wondering back here, what is this email list for? Oh, I thought we were going to get an email list. Okay, if we're already getting the email, we don't need to put our name on here. If you're not getting email, put your name and an email address. Okay, that's what I thought. We weren't sure. Listo, señor. Is this thing? Yeah, there it is. There it is. Uh, okay. Um, who? Yeah. Who? Who's your favorite um, congressman today and in history, if you have one or two or more? Uh, today. That's best. Yeah. I'd have to back into answering that question. Um, the way I back into it is my biggest disappointment these days has been Obama because he didn't see himself as the reviver of the New Deal. Uh, given the 30, 40 years of my adult lifetime of how, how much ground has been gained, uh, working with the enemy was not the way to go. The way to go was to go over the heads of, of everybody on the right and on the left, okay, who've been bought and go to the, to the American people and start rolling back some of the rollbacks on, on the New Deal. If you want to think um, uh, uh, Martin Luther, there was, was the Reformation, but there was a counter-reformation, right? And uh, uh, Obama needed to think of himself as the leader of the counter-reformation. We're going to get back to the true faith. And he didn't do that. Th that's been my biggest disappointment.
So no congressman stand out to you at all? I like Bernie, uh, uh, the guy from Vermont, is it Bernie Sanders? Yeah, I like him. Um, he, uh, he's supposedly going to go out to Iowa and he's going to test the waters and, and see about a presidential uh, presidential run, but it, it's it's uh, it's not going to happen. But um, but yeah, I would I'd have to say that of of um, all of them these days. But of course, he's he comes from a, from a state where you can you can get away with that. You know, I mean, uh, the the influences there are much different than what they are. Um, uh, let me ask more. You didn't answer anything. Uh, uh, I got another question, m more serious. Um, have you heard the term composite government in, in relation to the, the CAFR, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report? I've heard you mention the CAFR before, but you have to refresh my memory. Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. It seems to indicate that um, what they found, what they call composite government, not mean just one entity like uh, the federal government, but several things like states and even uh, pension funds um, own the blue chip companies, GM, GE, Raytheon, <laughs> Exxon. So, so that's pretty interesting right there. But because when she was talking about China and, and this and that, why did the government did subsidize moving GM, didn't it? Subsidize what? Moving GM to China. Moving what to China? General Motors. General. I don't Motors. know if they subsidize it or not, but I do know that it was a, a business decision that was driven by profits. So the government had nothing to do with that. I don't know, hmm. and I, I don't anyway, know. Anyway, it's, it's something to look into because uh, there, it seems like. Um, the government owns the corporation as much as the corporation runs the government. I, I would argue in the reverse. Uh, I would argue that um, one of the biggest Tea Party fallacies these days is being mad at the government, which is a lot like being mad at a weapon that, and putting a weapon on trial for perpetrating a crime, right? It's the guy that pulls the trigger. Well, it's, well, it, I don't think that the government are buying corporations. I think it's the other way around. Okay. Yeah. I think our government was founded on a principle of free enterprise, not capitalism. Capitalism is a subset of that activity, but when it takes over and becomes predominant, then what you have found is that greed and lust for power has taken over and hence people in Congress are bought off to not enforce the antitrust laws, for instance, that kept free enterprise working. But uh, free enterprise, for instance, the antitrust laws should have been applied to Walmart decades ago to break that company up because look at all of the moms and pops businesses that are gone today. And those, many of them, were the backbone of our economy. And then we have the governments that we've had passing things like NAFTA and GATT, and they want this Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Atlantic Trade Partnership. This is to get rid of the middle class and put everything into the tone of capitalism for the very, very wealthy. I mean, if, if you take home a salary of fifty or or $100,000 a year, and the boss of your company takes home a twenty to $100 million bonus, you're a slave. You're not in free enterprise. So what can we do to get back to free enterprise as opposed to either socialism or capitalism? Because we're not capable of handling those two, in my opinion. Well, a good start would be to break up the banks. I mean, uh, they, they need to be too small. Uh, they're too big to fail. They're still too big to fail. So we need to do that. Um, uh, what you say, I find difficult to, to disagree with uh, very much of it because when I drive down Route 66 versus any interstate, I mean, I, you can see exactly what you're talking about. You see all these mom and pops that were once thriving along Route 66 
We're talking about the eras of the 30s, 40s, on into the 50s, but now all you see is corporate logos when you drive down Interstate 30, or just about um, uh, uh, in, in, in any other place. Did, did they answer it, or is there something I left out? Yeah. It is, uh, it is my understanding that, uh, at least I was told recently, that Karl Marx coined the term capitalism. I would put it to you that as long as we are living within the scope of Karl Marx's terms, we're going to end up with a, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're in, in the wrong rut, let's put it that way. Uh, GM, uh, GM got either five billion or ten billion. I don't recall exactly, but they they got uh, a, a five billion or ten billion tax break if you check the record. Um, it's absolutely atrocious that the government gave GM uh, a bonus for relocating. Uh, that's that's supplying information. It's not really a question. All right, I can't disagree with you. Well, is it time for me to sit down and let people? Jim, another question. Uh, you mentioned um, Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. um, question, what do you make of Elizabeth and what do you think her chances are? Well, I think her chances are slim, uh, but then again, a lot of strange things happen in American politics, as you're uh, uh, well aware. I do know that she was down in uh, West Virginia helping out a candidate, and, and, and she was, you know, of course, um, uh, it was a tough race, but in that part of the country, uh, populism is playing well because, I mean, like, like, what are you going to do for me in the way of a job? So the candidate down there thought it would be worthwhile having Elizabeth come in and to help her out. Now Bernie Sanders, I saw here on uh, um, um, MSNBC, he's going to go out to Iowa and test the waters. You know, but Bernie's pretty extreme, so uh, I, I don't think he's going to uh, get very far. But as I as I fantasized. Strange things really do happen, you know, and um, I do know, the only thing I know for sure is that populism has been fed a lot of raw meat lately. <laughs> it's really stoked up and angry, okay, and both parties are trying to figure out a way to exploit that. I'm positive that they want to exploit that and um, I think the Republicans have their convention first, do they not? Yes. I think they do. Now, if, they're there, if, if they come up with a populist candidate, what do you suppose the Democrats are going to do? They're going to think twice, okay, about who, I mean, it may not be Elizabeth, but, um, but you know, if Hillary gets the nomination, right? And if Hillary says, well, I'm a populist too, that's going to play about as well as Romney saying, you know, I'm one of you. <laughs> you know, in fact, would you like to bet $10,000 that I'm not? You know, so, so I, it, to me, uh, the, the real wild card in this upcoming presidential election is the role that populism is going to play. Now, if it manages to be powerful enough to um, have appeal to a wide range of people, then both parties are going to have to rethink their thinking. That's, that, that's my view. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, now it's your turn to talk. Who wants to be first? Who's got to be a first? I can't believe this. Don't I have a first? I'll be first. Uh, be first. All right. <laughs> oh, 
Well, as a, as a long-term observer of American capitalism, um, <laughs> I'm one who's benefited from it. As Jim, that, by the way, that was, that was really great. I enjoyed it, the whole, the whole deal. But you're, really, thank, thanks very much. It's, I think you expressed um, the views of many of us here, actually, and the frustrations. But um, what, what I will say is that I agree with you. What we've seen is this train wreck of this capitalism, which when, we, when I came and when, when we were young here, and it was just wonderful. In fact, my wife and I thought it was, this is fantastic. It was so cheap, everybody was working. I mean, it just seemed to be going along so well. And, um, but um, uh, I was not naive enough to think that this whole process would, would go along forever. I mean, I looked at who was running things, especially at Xerox. And their lack of intellect was, to me, surprising. A true lack of intellect. And if you follow what happened to Xerox, you'll understand why. Because Xerox should have been Microsoft and Apple rolled into one, because it invented all the things that, that made them good. And I saw it being fritted away. I mean, it was heartbreaking, but um, basically speaking, we don't, we don't admire and and go for people with intellect, really, in this country. We seem to, you know, like, oh, you're a geek, you can't be, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, but getting back to capitalism, um, really, when I saw, living in Europe in the 50s, we saw that American foreign policy and the expansion of American po policy overseas was founded on sort of one principle, and that was, where is the, where is the nearest dictator that we can get near and bribe and, and, and grab assets in, 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 that, in that country. For example, why didn't America that always preaches about democracy, why didn't, why didn't uh, America go to India, for example, which, which is and was a democracy? Why did it choose to go to, to China? I think the answer is simple. It is a dictatorship a totalitarian dictatorship. It was somebody they could cozy up to and get, you know, negotiate with a single group, okay, and, and as you say, set up business there. And I think when you start to do this, this is not capitalism. I mean, this, and, and what you have operating, as I said before, this is not a capitalist system, it's a kleptocracy, <laughs> a basic kleptocracy. And as such, you know, and, and this system cannot survive. You can't, you can't run huge trade deficits, uh, you know, year in, decade in, decade out, but that's what America's done. One day the elastic band is going to break. One day, um, you know, China will say, no thanks, we don't want any more of your dollars. We've got enough already. We don't know what to do with them. But what I did predict was, which just happened, what's happened, I mean, England, by the way, is in a similar uh, bind, and we, we have um, an extremist party called UKIP that people are now turning to in droves because they've given up on all the, the three parties and they're fed up with massive immigration, massive um, loss of jobs, massive low wages, that, and, and the country not really recovering. And that's exactly what we see here. They think America is slowly recovering, well, perhaps it is, but most people have not seen it, you know, perhaps it will come about. Um, so, um, but, so, the real problem is, I don't see any politician standing up and, and explaining to Americans, look, you've been living under some, some myths, you know, you know, one being American exceptionalism and, and many others, and I, I won't bore you with, but, you know, the American people, I think, to, to um, change must be told the truth about what, what's going on, why it happened, what the corporations are doing, what Wall Street's done, you know, how things really work. And, and, they, and really, somebody must come up with a plan. Now, I, I've proposed certain things, but the question is, you know, are, are Americans ready to look in the mirror and say, OK, what should we do? Who, who, who is a leader that we can cogently understand and trust? And, you know, it, it is serious. I mean, it really is getting more serious by the moment. And, and you're right, Jim. I mean, we, we've been exporting technology and jobs <laughs> year in, year out. And one day, 
Will there be any technology left here? Will there be any? And, and the other fundamental question is, can America recover? I mean, has it gone too far to bring back jobs and, and technology and so on? I mean, you can't go on giving away your secrets and your money, uh, you know, year in, year out. And the other thing is, America just cannot, just like England. England re retreated from empire, yeah, I'll say, because it just didn't have the money. Well, America hasn't had the money for 30 years. So I've got to retreat sometime. <laughs> Okay, who's next? Come on up here. Dearly beloved, hello. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a congressman that was so full of dignity and uh, integrity. And um, this congressman was actually a congresswoman which is favored these days, and also black. Not, not just 10% or 30% black, but really black. And really, this is just a fable though. Once upon a time, this, this congressperson um, was more articulate and, and brilliant than even Obama or even Michelle. And this congressperson was young, younger than Obama. And this congressperson looked like he was going to become a president. In fact, did run for president of the United States. And once upon a time, this uh, congressperson, in, in her duties, she asked um, Donald Rumsfeld, how come uh, you, you, get, you, you put these people back in business that were uh, running child uh, kidnapping rings and child sex slave rings in Eastern Europe? And then uh, once upon a time she said, well, uh, Mr. Eberhardt, the, uh, the head of the Joint Forces, the, the highest military man in the uh, whole United States, uh, did the uh, really bizarre uh, exercises of 911, did they, did they help, or I mean, did, did they get in the way of, uh, of us having a zero response? And how come nobody got fired or even demoted or questioned about the complete failure of the U.S. defenses on 911? And uh, the, co the general said, no, these exercises helped us. They put um, uh, dozens and dozens of fake airplanes on, this, on the radar screens. To uh, uh, and they were uh, making fake attacks, even on the Trade Center. And... Uh, so once upon a time, the, uh, this, this uh, congressperson who was a Democrat um, got in trouble with the Democratic Party, even though she was a, a, the most popular uh, congressperson in, in uh, Georgia, that's where she came from, uh, the Democrats themselves got rid of her. And now she's gone. But she's still alive, and her name is Cynthia McKinney. Yes, this country is a kleptocracy, and it has been for a very long time, and that is why any speak, speaking about socialism or capitalism, the success or failure thereof, is somewhat of a moot point, because the country is being looted. And you can't support either system when you're being looted. And we've been seriously looted. I don't know how many people are aware of it. Wachovia was brought up on charges and, and convicted of... Uh, laundering $387 billion of uh, drug money. Wells Fargo took them over. I think the slap on the wrist, they were charged about $10 million fine. Nobody went to jail. The banks own aircraft that are used to bring, bring drugs in. We have a very corrupt system here, and it's out of control. Some people I've uh, talked to, interviewed, Put it back to the 1947 national, uh, what was that, 1947 um, 
National Security Act that created the Central Intelligence Agency. And um, they say that uh, we'll never have our country back as long as that's not repealed. It's, it's really hard to tell what steps in the process uh, have been the greatest uh, undermining. But we have a predatory class. That's really what we have. I have uh, friends from the left who call it the radical capitalists. But what do the radi radical capitalists want? What are they doing? They're actually wanting a form of collectivism. They're wanting us socialized. Talking about how the Republicans are winning and so forth, I think that's obscuring the issue here. Nobody's winning. None of us are winning. Who is winning is, is this, what some people call the 1%, others call the radical capitalists. Um, you might call them the criminal kleptocracy. Um, and, and it's really interesting. We were discussing here, I think if you go check the facts, government is 60% invested in some of the uh, major corporations. They're, they are actually, in, in some of the corporations, they are the major, the major stockholder. And when I say government, I'm talking about government funds. So it's, it's a question of, um, I mean, they may as well be married. I mean, it's, it's the same interest, really. And uh, I, I really think we need to go back, back to terms. I would highly recommend, it might be disturbing, but I would recommend seeing if you can still get in to see uh, the third edition here of Atlas Shrugged, called Atlas Shrugged, uh, Who is John Galt? And it's a real big issue. I mean, Ayn Rand has, uh, has ideological um, um, issues as big as a barn door you could, you know, fly a plane through, basically. But she has a few things right. And uh, her characteriza characterization of the producers and the looters, it's really interesting. Who are the looters? Who are the producers? I, I think her utopian Valhalla, where the producers were hanging out, might in our day be China, perhaps. Gives you pause for thought. Did we drive them away? Did the uh, socialist um, uh, union, unionist, um, uh, uh, did, did we pass enough laws that they couldn't make money here? Was there really no profit margin here? Or was that engineered too? Is it an engineered demise? I'll say this is real unemployment. I've heard in way too many conference calls from way too many experts that uh, real unemployment right now is 22%. The government's lying big time. People are saying no. Well, I guess you rely on the official, uh, the official mouthpieces then, CNN. It's much more than six percent. So I don't, I don't really know who we can rely on for news these days. I, uh, I listen to the BBC when I can. I listen to RT. I get two thumbs up. And uh, I, the, the reason is because we're not getting the news here. The media, the news, uh, the press used to be what was called the fourth estate. That was one of those balances which balanced out government. Folks, we're not getting the truth whether we're on Republican side or Democrat side. And we're all being played for chumps. We're all being plundered. I brought the team sheet <laughs> so I can remember what I'm thinking. Um, oh, it's a lot of doom and gloom, isn't it? Doom and gloom. Everything's going to fall apart and there's no future. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think the light is stronger than the darkness and I believe that our founding fathers were brilliant. I believe they put together a, a winning formula to make this country strong and to last forever as long as we stick to the plan that they created. 
However, we haven't stuck to the plan. That's the problem. That's the big, that is the problem. Okay, what have we done wrong? Well, our founding fathers did not agree to just have the rich people make the vote. No. They wanted everyone to have the vote. They believed in equality. Okay, let's deduct that from my five minutes, all right? <clears throat> Of course, obviously, the citizens at that period of time did not include the slaves that were brought here by British ships and the Brits, okay? And the women who were, you know, never got the vote until after the black people got theirs, right? We're the last. We're always the last. But nevertheless, the founding fathers did say, and I believe they really meant because the reality of today is different than the reality then. Okay, so the language is a little different, everything's different. But the basics are the same. They wanted equality for everyone. That is what they wanted. And that's what we have been striving for. And I think that we have come a long ways, okay, towards making that happen here in this country. Uh, the women can vote now. They do have a voice. The blacks do vote. They do have a voice. There's no more slavery in this country. Uh, the slavery, for the most part, had already disappeared by the time the Civil War came on, which was a big farce. The war was not about slavery at all. It was about money. Okay? It was about all of the manufacturing and the, the South shipping their, all the goods to the North and the North shipping it back to them for five times more money. And they didn't like that very much, so they went to war. But nevertheless, a uh, big problem that we have has always been money. It's always about the money, 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 money. Whether it's here locally or if it's the state or the nation or the entire globe, it's always about the money. I worked as the assistant to the director of Dresser Industries, which is a multinational corporation. They own Halliburton and, and uh, everything else. <laughs> But um, I learned more about war and what causes war by being the assistant to the director of the International Department than I did working for Navy Intelligence. Okay? It's about money. So let's take the money out of our elections, okay? Step number one, take the money out of elections. Step number two, get back to the ratio that founding fathers created for the delegates' representation in Congress, as long as we have killed that ratio, we are not getting the people who represent the middle class elected to office. And as long as the people in the middle class are not being represented, we're going to be top heavy, okay? We're not going in the straight direction here. We're off course. So, uh, and it, it isn't the Democrats that wants to de deregulate everything. It's Republicans that want to... Wait a minute, I'm saying that backwards. Wait a minute. Yes. <laughs> it's the Democratic Party that wants to regulate things and the Republicans that want to deregulate it, which cause the bubbles that burst here and there and every 10 years or so. Um, Thomas Jefferson uh, and, uh, and James Madison and James uh, John Adams and James Monroe all wanted equal voices for all of the people, not just the wealthy. And education was named as the cornerstone to keeping a democracy strong. Uh, today we have big differences. So a lot of people here are saying, well, they're all the same. You know, it's a cockfight. Right? Uh, there's no difference between this party and that party. Yeah, there's a huge difference. I don't call it capitalism. I call it extreme capitalism. Okay? Because it's all about the money. The money, money, money. Okay? Uh, the, uh, America and democracy cannot be just about the money. They, they have totally lost what our founding fathers created. That's what caused the people going to China and taking all of the manufacturing industry with it 
and all of the jobs, extreme capitalism, extreme capitalism, where they've lost sight of what the money is for, what it's all about. It's to raise the tide for, so that all of the boats are lifted, whether it's a, a board or a yacht. <laughs> um, Everybody wants to be here, but if we have smaller districts, we can elect middle class representatives, and the middle class will give us back the balance that we had in the beginning in the first hundred years. We were doing very well. It's easy to see the destructive uh, <laughs> the destructive nature of extreme capitalism. That's kind of uh, obvious. Is it possible to self-govern? Not if the extreme capitalists are running the country. So until we take the money out of elections completely and just give all of the candidates equal funds like they do in Britain, then we can have middle class folks representing us and we will have a true populist movement that is good for the country and stop the top 1% from redistributing the wealth from the middle class to themselves. I don't know your name, but you hit the ball in the head when you said take the money out of politics, but I got a better idea than I think yours was, is take all the money out of politics, every red cent, and don't give anybody one red cent. No, you said, you said give money to the politicians, an equal amount. Did, did you not? Okay. Get the contributions, yes. Yeah. Well, Nobody spends, here's what you spend on politics, a bumper sticker and a yard sign, that's it. We got the technology right now. Primaries, put them on YouTube, put them on live stream, let them fight it out. What, what's wrong with that? Then, in the finals, let them sell, you know, let them sell advertising to, uh, you know, to the networks to sell advertising because there's going to be a big, a whole lot of people watching these debates and uh, probably 90 days prior to the election. I'll bet they, you would have lots of uh, networks wanting to uh, host debates, lots of companies wanting to pay for the advertising, and you take the money out of politics, I'll guarantee you one thing, <clears throat> those tr foreign trade treaties will be amended. And by the way, on the 25th, We've got a speaker coming in, and I hope the hell she does a better job of trying to explain foreign trade than I've done, because I, I don't think anybody in this room really, a few people get it, but they don't understand. They say, why does, or the, does the government ship the jobs overseas? <clears throat> because the answer's simple. You can pay someone a decent wage here or a poverty wage over there. And if you think for one second that the savings are being passed on to you, you better think again because they're not. The people are, that are getting the, the savings are the big business people that promote these doggone trade treaties. And... Uh, She's also going to be talking about this TPP. Well, let me tell you what that's, a, I mean, what that's about. It's world government under corporate control is what it's going to be about. You won't even be able to, a 
foreign company will, will be able to sue the U.S. government in a private tribunal. No appeal process. If uh, <clears throat> it would eliminate food safety, drug safety, in other words, if someone says, hey, listen, these uh, drug laws, we don't like that. It could be some guy in China that doesn't like it, or some, anybody. They can see the U.S. government. No appeal process. Private tribunals. This thing ought to scare the living crap out of you. Because if, if, if this TPP gets passed, Big business will control key elements of our society and Asian society. And our beloved president is talking about the European trade agreement in addition. This, is, this, this thing, bottom line, it's corporate world government. That's what it is. Anyway, take all the money out of politics, That'll change. That's that probably would do more good than anything else we can come up with. Be here on the twenty fifth. <laughs> well, this is a very stimulating presentation today, Jim, and thank you very much for it. Um, my analogy last week or so of a cockfight is perfectly on. I totally disagree with you on that because it takes money today, as we've talked about a bunch here, to get into politics and to get anywhere in politics. And these large corporate interests are putting the Democrats in office just as much as the Republicans, and that's why we have a Democratic-controlled Senate. I mean, wake up, folks. There's no, like, and I, I'm not a supporter of George Wallace and his racial policies, but he made one statement over and over in every political campaign he had when he was running as an independent. There's not a dime's worth of difference between the Republican and Democratic parties, quote, unquote. I believe that's why he was shot, because it stopped him from saying that, and if you say something long enough and loud enough, the people will begin to believe it, quote, unquote, Adolf Hitler, in German, however. We absolutely need to get the money out of politics. We need to get capitalism broken all apart with the, uh, the elimination of things like NAFTA and GATT and uh, come on the 25th because that Trans-Texas or Trans-Pacific Partnership is the greatest danger that we've seen in a long time. And there's another one for the Atlantic community that they're working on and, and the people of this country will have no voice in it. Our Senate and our House will have no voice in this. This is something President signed and so forth. It is all corporate. We are looking at a world today that is run by fascism. And for those people who don't like to hear the term, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist, I say, wake up. These people have been planning these things for decades and they're taking over gradually. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. And we've practically lost all of our freedoms in this country. I, am, I cannot believe this is the country that I lived in in the 40s and the 50s when I was growing up. It's not the same country anymore. And the responsibility of the government is to follow that constitution to the letter and to enforce its meaning which gave free enterprise and the greatest revolution of economy to the world until large corporate interests began to tear it down and take over. Uh, if you have not read The Creature from Jekyll Island, I've said this a dozen times, do it. We need to get rid of that absolutely illegal criminal banking system that we have. We need to realize that. All wars are bankers' wars. Uh, download the book, it's a free PDF, uh, The Nameless War, and read it. And then the book, Germany and England, and read it. Our history books don't even give us a full, true account of history. 
Uh, even ancient Egypt has far more interesting things in it than we've ever been taught. Uh, we vilify that which we defeat. The victors write the history books. And the victors are going to write the history books about us too. Frankly, I think at every single level, anybody involved in using depleted uranium armament, I'm not armament, uh, shells, it needs to be criminally prosecuted for their war crimes against people. The, the, it's just horrible. Up from what I've heard, up to 20% of births now in Iraq have birth defects, the children, because of this radiation that we have just spread all over that country. It's the insanity of the corporate world that allows nuclear power plants. Those are insane. We have sources of power that are endless and free. And this is since Tesla we've known about this. And this is all covered up by the interest of large corporations that like to make their money. We've got all kinds of technology that uh, would revolutionize this world. One of them, a friend of mine was involved, called uh, aluminum oxide foam that the Defense Department, uh, DARPA, confiscated. Uh, aluminum oxide foam is stronger than any material known. It has temperature resistance way up around 3600 degrees Fahrenheit, at least in excess of that. And it's as light as balsa wood and it's stronger than any form of steel by many times. 3600 degrees Fahrenheit. And I had a friend, I held a piece of this in my hand one time. Well, DARPA came along and took this away. We could make almost anything with it. We have so much that is confiscated by the large corporate interest in the name of national security. And what we need to do again is, as has been said here a number of times tonight, get the money out of politics, limit terms, do not have people who are there. For, we've got plenty of brilliant people in this country who can step in and take it for another few years. We need to do these things, folks, or we've lost it, and we need to reinvigorate our educational system because Americans are being dumbed down. And this is showing we've gone from number one to 40-something in educational standards in the world. So it, it goes on and on. You were up there once. Well, make it quick. <laughs> Due to energy cutbacks, the light at the end of the tunnel has been cut off. The Trans-Pacific Partnership that they're talking about is a real serious issue. I would recommend everybody being here because uh, I've already had a presentation of that. I got a chance to tape. If anyone wants a preview, available here. Um, deducing what's really going on, um, if the Constitution is written on stone tablets or whether it is a living document, I assure you the Trans-Pacific Partnership is making an end run around it. And if this does not have our attention, it needs our full attention. What is the issue? When we start boiling all this down, the issue is individualism versus collectivism. Collect Agenda 21 collectivism. Thank you. I think I'm the last man standing, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> right. Anyway, I want to thank our speaker tonight. I think he did a terrific job. He got us all thinking. That's the main thing. Uh, Winston Churchill once said that the Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they try everything else. And I think that's where we're at. We've been on the decline. Our jobs went overseas. We can't support our infrastructure. We need to put tariffs on corporations, not on countries, where every product imported will have a tariff equal to the difference in labor and environmental costs. Then corporations would have to, the option to produce things here to sell here would be as it would be far more economical to do so. Then we could take action to reduce the hours of work per day to say a six hour day instead of an eight hour day without reducing the pay per day. We could change the Adamson Law and the Fair Labor Standards Act to increase overtime to double time so the cost of overtime would outweigh the cost of fringe benefits. Then the manager would make a determined decision for profit to hire more people instead of working existing people longer hours 
which we wanted in the first place. 25 million people could be re-employed full-time, making them taxpayers instead of tax drainers. Now, before any of this can happen, we have to reduce the influence of money on congressional elections. The challenges when incumbents have received absolutely nothing in campaign contributions in the past 14 years, and as corporations controlling Congress is by definition fascism, which was mentioned earlier today, Congress needs to act to instruct the Federal Communications Commission to require the media to provide sufficient free airtime in general elections, the last 90 days of a general election, then the incumbent and the challenger would both have free airtime. Congressmen would be able to keep their money and obtain free airtime. They'll vote for it. The end result would be a Congress that represents the people instead of those who are currently buying their vote in Washington. Then legislation could be passed to level the playing field on corporate power, improve working conditions for the people Congress is supposed to represent, and have a general improvement in the United States economy without fear of the dollar being thrown off its pedestal, which is a very real thing that we face today. Anyway, that's my thought on the subject. And our speaker now gets to respond. Oh, your speaker gets to respond. You have, oh, you want to be a, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I thought you I'm going to borrow your tactic. A parable, a fable? Mine was true. Okay. I know, I looked it up. And I know that she ran for Green Party president. Okay. Or for president on the Green Party ticket as well. Um, okay. Yeah. No. Um, I've already looked into her. I'm going to say thank you, Jim, for preparing the talk. Thank you for letting me read it, too, to catch up on what I missed when I wasn't here. Um, I think one of the valuable things about this forum is the fact that we all come together with our varied experiences and backgrounds, and we contribute to the discussion. And it's always a little bit different depending on who is here and how well the speaker prepares and how well the speaker is knowledgeable about the issues, not just of today, but the historical events that led up to it. And so for that, I say, I never want to miss a talk when Jim Love is presenting. There are very few people that I would say that about, but I'm very glad that you stepped up again to talk. And yeah, thank you. I, I will say that some of the things that I hear from the podium from time to time are things that, you know, if this happened, then all this is bad. Or, you know, that there's an opposite belief that deserves equal weight to something that is conventionally accepted as a belief. Let's say that I'm a five-year-old and I think that candy for breakfast is marvelous. <laughs> candy is not a food, it's a treat. Okay? I, I think we have to mature in our belief systems and our ability to discern truth from fiction enough to where we don't give equal weight to opposing arguments just because it seems like that's the right thing to do. And I think we're all on a bit of a journey here, otherwise we wouldn't bother to come back and talk and listen. We're all on a bit of a journey to uncover a little bit more truth. And along the way, we hear a whole bunch of nonsense. And I just have to call it foolishness from time to time. I have to call it foolishness that your vote doesn't count, or that both parties are exactly the same, or that um, good and evil are merely flip sides of the same coin. I reject that notion. Okay, darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. And I think that yes, our founding fathers and mothers, because there were some, did build on something that we have the duty to be good stewards of by voting, by participating, 
by stopping kicking and throwing the baby out with the bath water because the baby got dirty in the mud, okay? And I, I, it bothers me every time I hear somebody say, all parties are the same, they all want to screw you. I don't, I reject that. I, it bothers me to hear somebody say, all politicians are dirty and corrupt. I think, yes, if you're going to swim with pigs or, you know, play in the mud with pigs, you are going to get a little bit dirty, right? I, I guess I'm trying to very, not very eloquently lay some concepts out there for people to just challenge what in the hell you're repeating day after day. Okay, I had a little discussion with somebody at the store who believes that because the government potentially did one thing bad that none of the government can be trusted. And I have to only imagine what that person went through as a young person to believe that one thing bad means everything is terrible. You know, and I have to have a little bit more optimism than that. And I have to understand that my vote does matter and that people align themselves with a particular party because they believe that that party is going to do more for them, generally speaking. Maybe not perfectly, but generally speaking, that party is going to do more for them than the other party. And I challenge every single one of you, before you go vote, if in fact you do, to look up your own general party platform and see how much of that you agree with. And I'd say that if it's 80%, then that is still a passing grade. If it's 30%, then they have failed you, and you need to think again about how you're voting. Thank you very much. Susie, were you trying to say something like, well, those damn liberals, they want to uh, they want communism and socialism, or those damn Republicans, they want to take away your uh, Social Security, or take away your rights. They don't care. You know, uh, I mean, I mean that, that's kind of what. There's always a lot of blame. They want to do this. They want to do that. Well, they don't want to do nothing except promote their own interest. And uh, I guess I'm not saying it very eloquently either. Uh, but but when you know. You start pointing through, you want to do this and you want to do that, you don't care, that's all you care about. That kind of poisons the, the atmosphere. And uh, and then you're in a rut, I guess. But it's just saying they want to do this, Maybe we gotta, we gotta say, this is what we wanna do. And here's what, why I don't think their idea will work. Something like that. Anyway, uh, that's, it. that's about it. Okay, I think our speaker gets to comment on the comment now and close this meeting. He gets the last word. Yeah, you, you, you were so well before that you got everybody talking. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm going to start with uh, Winston Churchill. I mean, and, and the reason why is because we need to take a cue from uh, Winston during World War II, said he had nothing to offer but blood, sweat, and tears. 
Uh, that's what we need to hear from our leadership these days. I don't want to hear that our best days are ahead of us, don't worry about it, none of it's your fault. Just blame it all on the other guy. It is our fault, partially. So the deal is, is I want a politician to stand up and say, we're in a ditch, we need to fix it, you need to do your part. And if you can have a system uh, where there is a spirit of, of self-sacrifice, everybody doesn't have to sacrifice everything, just some, we'll be a lot better off. At least we can move in the right direction. Um, but how you move in the right direction, you need a plan. We don't have an industrial policy. We should have an industrial policy. I don't give a damn if you think it is socialism or not. We need a plan to go forward. And we need to know how we're going to cooperate. And people need to be made to believe, okay, that there's a place for them. A good place to start would be by rebuilding the uh, infrastructure. Why haven't we done this? Interest rates are at an all-time low. We had millions of people who are unemployed. It was a very obvious thing to do. Why didn't we do it? Maybe you can answer that, uh, that I can. Uh, the kleptocracy was mentioned. Yeah, there is a kleptocracy. The reason why there is a kleptocracy, at least in part, is because there are insufficient criminal penalties for wrongdoing. The SEC can only label civil suits. We need to send people who run banks, who stole money, to jail. You would have much less of a kleptocracy, but try to get a bill through, okay, like that, and, and uh, you know what the outcome is going to be. With respect to smaller districts, I would say this. Uh, it's not so much the size, and I'm, I'm coming back to that point again, it's redistricting. We need a representative sample of people so that these representatives are accountable to someone more than the wacko right wing or the wacko left wing, right wing, if you want to talk about Berkeley, California. Okay, uh, but I'm balanced in, in that respect. Um, the, the men, there was mention made of the Civil War uh, was for money only. Well, partly true. The, the plantation aristocracy in the South liked things the way they were, and they knew damn well that without a slave base, okay, that their economy would be destroyed. That's what Gone with the Wind is all about. There's no question about that. But you do not want to lose sight of Lincoln's vision. What the Civil War was all about, as far as Lincoln was concerned, is that the Union would be preserved. And the reason it, the, he wanted the Union preserved is he knew that as soon as you recognize uh, the South's right to secede, each state would declare themselves a separate nation, and then they would go to war with one another, and then we would be picked off and divided by all the European powers that have moved back in. So we're, for Lincoln, for the South, I agree, the, the, the aristocracy in the South was all about money, the slave base, and their, their, their way of life. But for Lincoln, it was the Union, above all. You know, I mean, and while we're talking about Lincoln, let us talk about the Constitution. Lincoln trampled all over the Constitution. He suspended habeas corpus. And you know why? Because he wanted to do the right thing. Hello? If you have to misinterpret the Constitution in order to do the right thing, go ahead and do it. I'm talking to our Supreme Court justices right now. Now, last thing. Hank asked me about my favorite politician, then or now, and somebody mentioned fascism. Uh, there's a connection. Um, somebody asked Roosevelt, who is my favorite politician, uh, apart from Lincoln, to describe fascism. He said, oh, that's easy. That's when private interests own the government. Does this ring a bell? Okay? I say this. The New Deal was a good deal. And the New Deal was a good deal because it balanced power, okay? And it was redistributionist in nature 
And above all, the people who vilified Roosevelt most were, of course, the class that he came from, you know, the Hudson Valley pol poltroons, right? These idiots did not recognize what, what Roosevelt had done for them. He saved capitalism from itself, which is what needs to happen periodically. And this nonsense, okay, that we don't need regulations and control and government supervision because we know what we're doing has been proven wrong three times in my adult lifetime. Three bubbles. So, you want my, uh, uh, of the 20th century, my, my political hero, FDR. FDR. The New Deal was a good deal because it recognized that in order to have an economy, okay, that meted out economic justice, you had to empower unions. And the reason you have to empower unions is because if you want justice, you must balance power. You cannot trust a privileged class to dispense justice if there are no incentives for them not to. Anyways. I've enjoyed this, and I hope you have too, and thank you so much for coming. Bye. Okay, we're going to retire to Starbucks down the street. This place closes at 9 o'clock. You're all welcome. Our speaker is welcome. His wife is welcome down there. We'll buy him some coffee and chew the, chew the fan some more. It's up to you. Anyway, uh, that's, that's it for tonight here. Thank you. See you next week. This is William, your videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like us or follow us and get notices 